Today, Ed Greenwood is here to tell you about Storm Giants. I am Ivan of Many Realms, and the physical release of the new Wizards of the Coast book, Big B Presents Glory of the Giants, is actually about to hit shelves. But you might have already encountered a Storm Giant before in an adventure published a couple years ago called Storm King's Thunder, where we're introduced to King Hecaton and his daughters. One could probably guess that Storm Giants are completely immune to lightning and thunder damage, but unless you've had a close-up encounter with one, you might not know that they're also totally amphibious, which some of you might know means that they can breathe both water and air. This video gives us a quick overview of Storm Giant culture, as well as mention some Storm Giant notables, what they're up to in the realms today, as well as what some of their motivations are. This is an excerpt from one of Ed's full write-ups, which covers all the Giants of the Realms, which is available on Ed's Patreon right now. But if you haven't had the chance to watch our episode on Fire Giants yet, I recommend you take a look up there. If you're enjoying this series on Giants, be sure to drop a comment and let us know what kind of Giant folk you'd like us to do next, and maybe let us know why they're so special to you. Be sure to like this video to show your support for Ed, subscribe for more videos just like this, and hit the bell icon to stay up to date on all of Ed's new releases. And if you want to pick up some super cool new adventuring gear, don't forget to check out Ed's shop. I'll leave a link to that down in the description. These solitary, contemplative seers keep to areas remote from civilization. They are most numerous in the mountains around Sossel, the Ice Rim Mountains, where they are the reason frost giants are so rare there, and Mount Skyfell. They do not tolerate interruptions by other giants well, and in particular, like to keep the warlike activities of the fire giants at a distance, and to remind cloud giants that storm giants are the pinnacle of giant kind, closest to the gods and deservedly so, not cloud giants. To human ears, storm giant names tend to sound emphatic, and they often end in ak, ik, and or. The storm giant Garthrak dwells atop two of the highest peaks south of Armridge and west of Sossel. He has abodes on two neighboring nameless mountains, where he commands three small families of storm giants who collectively refer to their settlements on surrounding peaks as Wind Vault. Although Garthrak's avid avocation is a study of the heavens visible from Toro, he has a practical side, seeing it as his duty to influence affairs in civilized oral, a term he considers overblown, as what he's seen of human society thus far he considers far less than civilized. Garthrak has taken to working with a select handful of human harpers in secret to learn of events in the human heartlands and sword coast and to locate and identify the layers of dragons. Garthrak uses what he learns of dragons to send expeditions from Windvolt to ruthlessly exterminate the worms. He also leads occasional raids into human territory, cloaking his raiding bands in severe storm weather with the aim of preventing the spread of humans north towards Windvolt. In particular, Garthrak is interested in distracting the humans of Rashomon from any thoughts distracting, mind you, rather than fighting, as he respects the power of the witches and wants to direct their energies elsewhere rather than making him them his foes, and in sharply curbing the power of Thay, so territorial expansion will be far from its strivings. The storm giant Golnor dwells atop Mount Skyfell in northwestern Anora between the Far Forest and the High Ice, where he is the head of his family of 16 storm giants. All are reclusive, but Koldar regards the Sword Coast North as his source of entertainment, and he wants the Silver Marches to survive, but not to flourish and grow in size and expand in his direction. So he manipulates weather across the Sword Coast North to batter the incursions of trolls, lesser giants and orcs against the silver marches, but also to hamper those in the marches prospecting and exploring eastwards. Koldor is not above making personal jaunts to negotiate with adventurers, threaten dwarves or sentient monsters, and deal with dragons, usually by manipulating or coercing adventurers or others into conflict with them. Koldor probably knows more about the recent unfolding history of the Sword Coast North from a largely passive observer's point of view than any other being alive today. His kin all sense he's becoming increasingly restless, so the question arises, what will he soon do with what he knows? If you're enjoying this video, please 
leave me a like, subscribe, hit the bell icon so you don't miss future videos. Thank you very much for doing this. It's your support that makes it possible. Go to my Patreon and consider becoming a protector of the realms. The storm giant Torek dwells in the southeasternmost ice rim mountains, south of Sossel and northeast of Resh. This is far indeed from the Sword Coast and the Heartlands, but Torek is an unusual storm giant. He sees himself as an adventurer, traveling the lands from his home westwards to the Sea of Swords and south as far as the Vilhorn, battling dragons, hunting down dragons and dragon eggs and dragon lairs, fomenting feuds among dragons, and stirring up fear and hatred of dragons in others. For personal amusement, he takes an interest in the deeds of adventurers, from halflings and humans to ogres, aiding and befriending some and thwarting or even challenging others. Torik wields a great sword that's enchanted to look like a gigantic scythe or axe until it's swung in anger, and whenever it's not being wielded in battle, it flickers back into its disguised appearance. Torik walks alone, but Elminster says he lost his beloved years ago through his own reclusive inaction, which is why the lone giant now adventures, seeking any trace of her and wanting to impress her with his changed ways. Her name is Ulora, but her whereabouts, even if she still lives, is unknown to Elminster and to Tora. She wielded powerful magic and liked to cloak herself in magical disguises, so finding her may not be easy. Welcome back, my friends, to the show that never ends. In this case, it's Realm Speak. And this time around, we're going to tackle a deity. This particular deity can be pronounced in various ways across the realms, depending on what your background is. So surprise, there are several pronunciations and they're all legitimate. So the two that you will hear both by worshipers of this deity and by people who are far traveled and you use the common tongue a lot like merchants this god is usually pronounced by those who worship the god Maglubiat Maglubiat if you don't really worship the god you just know that this god should be appeased you speak common a lot and listen to merchants who are speaking common you will hear this pronunciation. Maglubiet. Maglubiet. And anybody who worships or is a cleric or shaman of the deity, if they hear Maglubiet, they know that it is somebody speaking of their deity. They may, may also know oh, that it doesn't really worship. Uh huh. Got it. Believe me, the deity hears that pronunciation too. All Forgotten Realms deities can hear their names spoken anywhere in the realms. They tune this out because it would be a constant cacophony of every, but, you know, because people pray. But they can, if they wish, zero in on it. Just remember that. Next time you hit your thumb and go, just remember the deity hears you. <laughs> 